Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Workers' Mic right here on 720 WGN. My name is Ken Edwards with the Midwest Coalition of Labor. Sitting to my left is Ed Maher with the International Union of Operating Engineers. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, Ken. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm good. Uh, we, we have both been absent a bit. Yeah, I, I, I missed this place. I missed you, Ken. I'm, okay. It feels like a while since I've been here. Okay. Did I just make it weird? Yeah, thank you. Well, it's good to be back. How about that? <laughs> it is good to be back. Sounds better. Yeah, we have been doing a decent amount of traveling, huh? Yeah. I've been all over God's creation around the Midwest. I know you went to Oktoberfest. I did. How cool was that? Oktoberfest was fantastic. You had a good time? I, I always heard it's the most fun place in the world, and, and was uh, it? I wasn't disappointed. Good for you. Yeah. How long were you there? Uh, just a couple of days. That's awesome. Yeah, but uh, people from all over the world, nobody's fighting. Everybody's just... Uh, Wait, there's no fighting with, with a, a ton of beer and, and, Ger- I, I, and Germans? Seriously. No, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I mean... If there are people all dressed in black that if you start any kind of trouble, there is a team of them that come pick you up and take you out. So, but everybody's just uh, in a good you, mood. You don't want you don't want the team of black in Germany to come to pick you up and take you out. I mean, they looked pretty menacing. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I was having fun anyway. But, good for uh, you. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a great time. Yeah. Well, it's good to good to be back. Um, we have a decent amount to talk about today. Actually, we have a lot to talk about. We always have too much to talk about. Uh, we're excited to have Ron Whittingham on from Megan Absolutely. Financial. He's always really informative so yeah. we're, we're stoked about that um let's get to a couple of positive things um you have a, an announcement about uh right an apprentice yeah so this week um local 150 opened up its uh, heavy equipment operator apprenticeship program so that's the operating engineers yes the operating engineers the people who operate all this heavy construction equipment yep. uh one month out of the year applications are available for the apprenticeship program and it's always uh very competitive Folks are, uh, you know, we we get a lot of applications for this. But how many spots do they open? Um, it depends. It depends on the work picture. I mean, uh, there's there's a lot of construction work going on. There's a lot coming for sure. Uh, these battery plants are creating a lot of demand. Uh, so I mean, if you know, we may have uh, you know two three hundred available spots. It uh, it's hard to say early on, but um, we know that there are going to be jobs available. So folks can apply for these jobs you can come to pick up an application at any of local 150's offices on designated days so uh, i'll just say for more information go to local 150.org slash apply that's, that's one that's, yeah local 150.org slash apply but it's a great opportunity it's an absolutely great opportunity and and uh once again you earn while you learn right if college is not for you or if you've been to college uh and are, are finding that maybe things aren't panning out the way you thought they would you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful career. And you join any building trades, whether it's the operators, the carpenters, the laborers, you know, the electricians, you join in a family. That's right? for sure. I mean, it's not just like, okay, hey, this is a great job. It really is like a cradle to grave job, right? Yeah, and, and you're learning a skill. You're you're becoming you're going to world class schools to become extremely skilled in whatever profession that is. So let's say ten years down the road, work is slow in Chicago. You can take your skill anywhere you want. Yeah, that's a, that, it's a, it's a good good point, and uh, you know it comes with a pension, health right. insurance, an annuity, yeah. uh, doctor's offices. I mean, literally, the world is your oyster. You know, so I would encourage anybody that's think about it. You know, give it a shot, apply. It's it's not an easy th- thing to get into, by the way. Right. I mean, it's 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 pretty competitive. Yeah. Um, but you know, this week I saw one of the former CEOs of Ford talking about the UAW strike and what the UAW was looking for and the fact that they were hoping to reinstate the pension plan. Good. And he just said, these are things that workers used to have, that workers don't have anymore. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, with the building trades and with Local 150, if you get in, you participate in a pension plan. I mean, these are things that still exist and they're stable and they're going to be here for a long time. Yeah, they, uh, you know, as we always said, you know, we've been around 100 plus years, we're going to be around another 100 years. That's for sure. Right. So that's great. Uh, there is also a, a job opening in Lake County Highway Department right now for what they call snowbirds, uh, but they're actually full time year round. And I think they pay about 28 bucks an hour. And, you, you know, once again, you plow snow, uh, but you work all, all, all week long. So it is a, a full-time job um, during the season. I think the season goes uh, until March or April. And it's also entree into potentially getting a job in Lake County Highway Department, which has a pension and health insurance right. and just, you know, pays a, a great wage. So there's, there's openings out there. And obviously we just mentioned two, but, you know, look online, right? Google apprentice programs. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll you'll see a ton of this stuff. So so that's good news. Um, let's talk about bad news. 
Okay. <laughs> you, you, got, you got me ready for it. The yin and yang. Yeah. And, and that is, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to say shame on the signature room. You know the signature room? I am. It's the uh, the place where everybody goes to get engaged in Chicago, or Absolutely. at least they used to. Oh, well, yeah, they did until the signature room up and closed with zero notice. Right. Well, they did give notice in the form of a piece of paper taped to the door, I think. Oh, that's what, that's what they did? <laughs> I think so. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, so this signature room has been around for a very, very, very long time. It's a Chicago institution, and... I think there was it was it was at the top of the John Hancock building, right? Right, yeah, and, and it was so, something. Uh, it was it was something before that. But I read um, an article in, in the Sun Times, which is a fantastic paper, by the way, uh, that there was a, a guy that worked there for forty six years. Yeah, forty six years. And you imagine waking up, you know, on your forty sixth year of employment, going to work, and there's a note on the door that says you no longer have a job. Right. And so unite here. Karen Kent and Company. Who, they represent you know, those. Uh, they folks, represent right? the 132 workers uh, that worked at the signature room that made the place so popular and so successful. Um, I'm not sure why they closed. I have zero idea. But they filed a lawsuit uh, against the owners of the signature room under what's called the Warren Act. And the, and the Warren Act is if you have more than, I think it's 75 mm-hmm. uh, employees, you have to provide 60 days notice so you can get retrained. And it's called, you know, basically it gives you, it's warning you that your job is going to be gone. Right. And so, and it's only fair, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I think. And the- by the way, 60 days is nothing. Right. I, I, the regulation, I think, was put in place just to avoid having huge numbers of people hit the hit the you know the the, the job seeking yeah right the right. unemployment rolls um, with no notice at the same time. So it's a law. It's very straightforward, and it seems that what Signature Room did is is blatantly violated that. You would think so, but you know that's up to a. a, a I'm know, no judge. A, I'm no lawyer. <laughs> yeah, uh, it it uh, seems <laughs> obvious, but then again, I don't know. You know that's that's the lawsuit. But you know, I talked to Karen Kent, and she makes a good point. It's not just about the lawsuit. This is about a Chicago institution that is in the hospitality industry treating its workers, you know, in a pretty unhospitable way. So what was the reason? Was it COVID? I have no was idea. It they didn't say increased traffic on Michigan Avenue I, or they literally I, everywhere I've read yeah. it doesn't say a word about why they closed. Yeah. I'll be I'll be honest. I haven't been to the signature room since probably about 2010, but I know that a uh, a martini in the signature room back then cost about $20. So <laughs> Maybe they throw a couple extra bucks on the martinis. Tourists are going to pay it. You know what you should drink instead? What's that? Jepson's Malort Pumpkin Spice. (laughs) Oh, are you kidding me? (laughs) They have pumpkin spice. The pumpkin spice has gotten it's gotten everywhere. When Jepson's Malort or whatever the heck it's called, when Malort has pumpkin spice, like that's it. I hate to say it. Has has Malort jumped the shark with pumpkin spice? I like. I wouldn't drink Malort on a good day, much less pumpkin spice. I will say Malort. It, it has street cred in Chicago. It's no like you don't about drink it. it unless you're a little bit tough. You can handle it. Now, pumpkin spice, <laughs> is this going to be like the new thing that goes in the uh, the tumblers for suburban moms to drink while they're power walking on Saturday morning? <laughs> so like, is that pumpkin spice? <laughs> yeah, pumpkin spice malort. <laughs> You imagine that they're com- walking at four in the morning. It, it, might, it might taste good going down, but it ain't going to taste good coming back up. Yeah, malort's. I Ooh. mean, what I, do they call it? It's a Chicago handshake. It's a drink, right? Yeah. And what is yeah. it, like a beer and a shot of Malort or something like that? I don't know. I don't know either. Yeah, I mean, Malort's got street All I know cred. is I've tasted it once. Yeah, even if you don't love it, you have to love it. And old, uh, wait, hold on. Just, this this just in from, from uh, Da Vinci Street. It's okay. An old style and Malort shot. Old style Malort. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Chicago handshake. Saving money. We're getting sloppy on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> I can appreciate that. Times are tough, folks. That's right. Not everybody can afford a $20 martini like Ed Maher. That was a long time ago. At the signature room. Mm -hmm. Shame on the signature room, (laughs) you know, and positive, you know, vibes to those that are out there looking for jobs. I know Karen and and her union uh, is going to make sure that those people are are well taken care of. Let Um, me point something out. I mean, you you mentioned Karen. Um, She was in the studio a couple of weeks ago, and this was after a victory with uh, the Kinsey Hotel. Yeah. And she was talking about all all the things that they've done recently. And she was coming off a big win, and then it's right back into it on behalf of these workers for the signature room. So there are people out there who think of a union boss as somebody who you know sits in a big leather chair smoking a cigar. But take Karen Kent as an example, and there are so many great labor leaders in the city. Um, you know, 
you you get a big win on behalf of your workers one day, but you don't even have time to sit back and enjoy it. No, you know, because it is, it's never ending right. issues, problems. You know, people coming after you, people firing your workers. It's just nonstop. Yeah, and, this and is the reality. A, yeah, this you know, is for, the, uh, of what a labor leader is in the city of Chicago. Yeah, you're fighting employers. You're fighting uh, anti-union government. You're fighting anti-union legislators. You're fighting an anti-union National Labor Relations Board. You you have one hand tied it, uh, you know, behind your back. Right. Right. due to the fact that our laws here are so abysmal when it comes to labor. So, you know, it takes a, a special kind of person um, to do that kind of work. And, you know, I think Karen is certainly one of them. Um, so uh, we got to take a quick break. Did um, you know, I just got this uh, across the news desk. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, uh, the Signature Room took uh, $2 million in PPP loans. Both, wait, all, wait a second. And those loans were say, forgiven. You're saying they took money. <laughs> For free. And then they didn't pay it back, and then they closed and put a notice on the door and shafted their That's workers. exactly what I'm saying. Shame on them. They're just terrible. <laughs> That's a you know, they, sh- they should have to pay ba- back that money. How about that? Did anybody pay back PPP? I have never st- heard a story I don't know. Is it, too, is it too late to get a PPP loan? I get about 14 calls on my I'm, cell phone from people that are trying to give them to me, you know, every day. But, oh, I'm going to try and get one. Yeah. Yeah, and then we're going to f- fire Da Vinci Street. <laughs> <laughs> the notice on the door. Just kidding. Just kidding, fellas. Yeah, yeah sorry. Ladies. All right, listen, uh, we got to take a quick break. Um, we will be back uh, with more of the Workers' Mic right here on 720 WGN. Welcome back, everyone, to the Workers' Mic right here on 720 WGN. I'm Ken Edwards, Midwest Coalition of Labor. Sitting on my left is Ed Maher, Operating Engineers, Local 150. Welcome back, Ed. Welcome back. So um, we got a few minutes uh, in in this segment. I wanted to just touch on something that is uh, timely and talk about a a faux pas, if you will. That's That's a French word for horrible mistake. Drew Barrymore. We talked about her a few weeks ago that she was going to start her show back up again during the writer's strike, which has settled. They haven't voted on it yet. We're waiting to hear the outcome. Uh, optimistic. But um, three of her head writers, I think like the main three writers, have said, I'm not going to come back to your show. Yeah. And guess what? Who can blame them? You want to be a scab? Like, unfortunately, like, that's going to be your legacy. Yeah. Like, I can't think of this woman now without thinking of the word scab. Yeah. And, and think about this. They were out for almost six months. Right. And a week before the end of the strike, there was progress being made in the strike, and everybody knew that. Yeah. Her and Bill Maher choose that point to say, yeah. ah, we're giving in. It's yeah, like we're going to give up. You've been at it for six months. You try, you, you waffle about you know giving up a, a week out, and that's what people will remember. Talk about tone deaf. And then, and so how, like, if you're these writers, right, and you were out on strike, and you were suffering, and you were just you know having a hard time making ends meet, for and, sure. and literally just really, really struggling, how do you go back to uh, Drew Barrymore's show and look her in the eye and go, hey, I know you were going to scab, but I'm going to come back and write for you. All, all I would do is write scab jokes. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so so let's what, talk, is, what is a scab yeah, anyway? Let's, so let's talk about a scab, right? So a, a scab is somebody that takes the job of a uh, a striking worker, right? Or does struck work, if you will. Right. Um, right? So it, it literally is... Um, a race to the bottom. And if you're watching the UAW strike, which we are, um, recently you've seen on the news, lines of cars waiting to get into these plants to basically take the work of these striking workers, or mm-hmm. at least attempt to take the work of the striking workers. Right. And, you know, I, I, I've read, you know, obviously varying things from, from people's comments, but in my humble opinion, there is nothing more lowly than a scab. Um, and you know, if you, you can look up scab and you can see some things about what, what's the author's name that Jack London, Jack London, you know, has he had a, a really famous definition of a very, scab. very famous definition, strongly pretty, worded, pretty, yeah, strongly <laughs> worded, pretty rough, uh, but accurate. And it's a situation where it's pretty simple. You know, if you want to go apply for a job in a non-union facility, well, that's, of course, that's your, that's your, that's your right. If you want to apply for a job in a union facility, of course, that's your right, but don't take somebody's job. Right. Because all you're doing is helping that company race to the bottom. And oh, by the way, when it's your turn to go out on strike, somebody's going to take your job. Right. So it really is like worker v worker. Well, yeah. I mean, let's take it back to the days of Jack London, which I think were early 20th century. Those were strikes where uh, if you went on strike or if there was an issue at work, 
they would have Pinkerton detectives beating workers with clubs. Yeah. You'd be on strike and there'd be people, uh, cops on one side and people with busted up faces on the other. So what would a scab be in that situation? Somebody who walked across the line and said, I'll do the work that these people with the busted up faces won't do. So they're out there struggling. And this person, by taking their work, has made things a little bit easier for the company to keep doing this, to yeah. keep doing this. So it's a... You know, it's it's kind of turning against your own people kind of a thing. And it's, it, it is, there's it really is, nothing lower than that. It is turning against your own people. And when you say your own people, it doesn't matter where you're from or what industry you're from or what state you're, you're from or what race you're You're a worker, working class, period. Yeah, not middle class, not upper class, not lower class, working class. And, and scabs, you know, let's put it this way. There are companies that send in replacement workers, right? right? That's their job. Mm -hmm. They'll find replacement workers for you. But, you know, and especially in the building trades, guess what? Would you want, uh, or, or here, how about uh, how about this? Would you want the, buy the car that's just off the line right. <laughs> that was made by the scabs, right? Well, right. Hey, I'm going to buy a brand new GM today. And it was just so happened it was made during the UAW strike and it's got three wheels. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ford told their uh, middle managers that white collar workers should be prepared to do blue collar labor. Yeah. And there were a lot of people out there saying, that's right. If the, if the manufacturing people won't do the job, somebody has to. It's yeah. like, if that's how you feel, go buy one of these cars. Like they should put a big red dot inside the door of every car that was made by replacement workers <laughs> yeah. so people can be like, oh, I'm buying, you know, whatever, an Explorer. A scab the, mobile. Yeah, it's like the guy who built this usually does payroll, and then the other guy is the guy who takes out the trash at the end of the night. But they, he, built, they built your car. He's watching YouTube, like, how to turn a wrench. There's lefty, tidy, righty, what is it again? Yeah. You know, left, I mean, it's just these like. These are skilled jobs, and when, when people who've never done them before step in to try to do them, as you tell me to make a car, tell me to start making manufacturing the first day i'm going to do a terrible job of it and guess what by the way uh workers of the world you have a right not to scab that's you right. have a right to say no thank you yeah and that's conservative protected activity i had a case once said years ago when i worked for the newspaper industry where uh, one of the newspapers i was representing was getting ready to strike mm -hmm. and they were training replacements and they were bringing them to chicago putting them up in hotels and a, a worker from another uh same company but a different state said no thank you i'm not gonna right. i'm not going to train and they fired him and but, we sued, and we won, and we got his job back, back pay, et cetera, et cetera. And he, he said, I'm, I'm not going to train to be a scab. I yeah. wasn't brought up that way. And that was protected, concerted activity. Do not scab. End, well, of dis end of discussion. Right. The federal law gives people the choice on whether to cross a picket line or not cross a picket line. And if they choose not to, you cannot retaliate against them for, for it. The, for the most part, right? Unless you're like, you know, super uber uh, management, not protected by the National Labor Relations Board. Right. But, but for the most part, people that are going to be brought in to, to scab are, are not that. So you can say no thank you. And and also, by the way, when they're offering 15 bucks an hour and putting something out in the local paper that says, hey, you know, come work for us and we're never, you're going to be working for the next 30 years. No, you're not. Yeah. As soon as the strike's over, you're out. Right? So how does that feel? Right? You walked in across the picket line, took somebody else's job, and then when the strike is over, you're out. Right? So Where's the loyalty? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just absolutely terrible. So I think... Uh, you know, if, if there's a lesson to be learned here, is is just don't scab, right? Don't run across somebody else's picket line. Well, don't cross picket lines is a very important thing because as consumers, that's that's something that people should just know. If you see a picket line outside of a business, it means that workers are struggling enough to be out on the street. Right. So don't walk in there. Like, at least talk to the picketers, find out what's going on, but don't just cruise past them. Yeah, don't shop in a place that has a picket in front of it. I was, you know, when my son was little, we were traveling, and I was like, you know, I had to get milk, and it was the middle of the night, and it was, uh, I think it was in California, and I'm like, okay, I'm going I'm to go get milk, and the first place I saw, which was far away, was a, a grocery store. <laughs> it was on strike. I'm like, you got to be joking me. So I <laughs> sat out there for 15 minutes, berated people people that were walking across the picket line and then went, <laughs> went down the street to 7-Eleven. That's what you do, folks. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, don't uh, don't cross picket lines, period, of the end. Give them a honk. Give them a, a thumbs up. When you see Scabby the rat, right? Yeah. You know, give give Scabby a, a thumbs up. But, but, you know, certainly do not cross a picket line. Drew Barrymore, Bill Maher. Maher. I don't associate with oh, him. good point. He yeah, says he, it wrong. Yeah. Listen, we got to take a break. Uh, we're going to come back with Ron, correct? That's right. All right Ron we'll Whittingham yep. coming at you. Yep. We'll be right back with Ron Whittingham uh, from Megan Financial right here on the Workers' Mic 720 WGN.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Workers' Mic right here on 720 WGN. I'm Ken. Sitting next to me is Ed. And we have uh, on our show today, as we discussed, Ron Whittingham from Megan Financial, one of the major, if not the most major sponsor of the Workers' Mic. Ron, welcome back. Welcome back, Ron. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, it's always good to have you. So let's, let's um, for those of you that haven't heard Ron in, in the past, Ron, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Sure. Um, so my whole career has been working with working class people. Our niche is with unions. Mm-hmm. We've been working with Local 134, the electricians here in Chicago, f- uh, for 27 years. Yeah. Wow. And, and what we do is we go to their hall. We just did one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had a retirement seminar. We just did a financial literacy seminar for them at their school um, last weekend. And so we educate the participants on what their benefits are. And when you say educate them about what their benefits are, explain that a, a little bit because Ed and I have always said, like, you know, we're, A, unions are our own best kept secret, and B, our benefits are are healthy, but they're complex, right? Yep, and and they're unique to each union, you know, so it's... Um, I think they're unique in the, in the, in the general scope of uh, working class, right? Because we have pensions and we have health insurance and we have doctors, off. I mean, there's a plethora of, of things. So you help, what, navigate that? Yeah, yeah, we, we sit there and, you know, we just give them the information on what their individual plans are, when to take Social Security, right. how Medicare integrates with their health insurance plan if they, if they have one, yeah. and we create a plan. So at the seminar, we talk about that generically. Yep. Then after, after the seminar, we, one of our advisors goes and sits at the kitchen table with that family right. and creates a plan. That's awesome specifically for that family for that family and each family is relatively unique right you might have three kids you might have two kids you might have none in college you might have one in college you might have three in college you might have a house you might i mean right everybody's got a bit of a different circumstance it's right it, it's very complex the cool thing for for megan financial though yeah is you know when working with 134 electricians we know those plans right like the back of our hand so well, we let's, let's let's t- let's talk about that now you uh and your company uh, uh but for a couple of unions are now uh, going to be, and we haven't, we've kind of soft launched this, but when we uh, trot out a quarter million new books, um, you're going to be the financial planner for all MCL unions uh, if people choose to use you, right? And and you're sort of our financial planner of choice, uh, but for a couple of, of offshoots here or there, right? Yep. And, and that's, you know, that's a heavy lift, Ron. You're going to have to learn I don't know. We have 400 locals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a tough job. But a lot of those operator locals have only the central pension fund. That's right. So, so, so there's some similarities. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're 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 this, a lot of them are the same. I and mean, defined benefit plans are typically very similar. You right. know, you have spousal benefit options. Sure. You, you you know what that is. They're you know when they you know the taxability that type of stuff. Social Security is the same for everybody. Sure. Health insurance, we have to find out about that. Right. Defined contribution plans, have to know about that. But then we have to dig down with that with that family. Like you said, Ken, everybody's different. Right. Right. I mean, some some spouses are working, some aren't. So we have to figure that out, and then we create that plan. And then, the obviously, it's up to the the member and his family, uh, or her family, to to sit with you and go, Hey, that sounds like a good plan. Let's do that. Right. So, I mean, they're going to get educated by you. And I want to pivot to this story um, that we were talking about for a second off air, and that is this, you know, I wouldn't say unscrupulous, but I, I got a call from a financial company, a large one, and it was just like some guy out of the blue. And he wanted to talk to me about one of my members, right, a member of the MCL. And I said, listen, I'm, what union is he in? I got 400 unions. Which one? Well, I don't know. Like, okay, well, that narrows it down, you know. I think he's an electrician. Well, which one, you know? And Mm -hmm. it was just ridiculous. And finally, I said, how about this? Get your guy on the phone, and then we'll figure it out. Get the guy on the phone. Of course, I got the guy off to the side, uh, hung up on the financial company, whatever. And I said, you need to call Megan Financial. End of discussion, right? They already know the answer to everything that that guy just asked me. Right. right? I'm not getting a call from... Ron Whittingham or anybody in your office going, hey, Ken, what's the benefits for blank? You already know them or you know how to go get them, right? Yeah, yeah. And and the thing with other financial advisors out there, I mean, people with pensions are very unique. That's Mm -hmm. absolutely correct. You know, there's only 4% of Americans have a defined benefit plan. That's it. Which, which is, it, it's, I mean, yeah. I thought it was so, six. Yeah, I mean, it's going down. <laughs> but I mean, that was, that was yesterday. 
<laughs> and, and these other, I mean, at least this guy, this financial advisor was taking the time to try to figure out yeah, what the benefits good, are. That's a good point. At least he called. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so he's, he, right. at least he made an effort because yeah. a lot of people just don't understand it and they right. put you in financial products that, that you don't need. Right. Because you right. already have guaranteed income. Yeah. You don't need some annuity. So you're talking, you're, you're really talking about financial literacy, if you will. Mm-hmm. I've heard you use that term before. Explain, what does that mean, Ron? Yeah, I mean, it's it's, a, it's defined as the knowledge to make smart decisions with your money. Oof. Yeah, and it's... Well, and, well, do you have that? I'm writing, I'm writing that down, financial <laughs> literacy. I'm going to try to learn more about that. <laughs> smart decisions <laughs> with your money. Yes. Like blackjack. Yeah, I mean, right? blackjack's a pretty smart. If you got to play something, you should play that. Stay on sixteen. That's pretty, pretty decent odds. I, you yes. know, I, so say at the financial advisor. <laughs> ha, Ken, take that. So, Ron, financial literacy, right? Like you said, you gave the definition out. Now, explain in real life what that means. Yeah. So, I mean, all it is, you, you want to do this early on. You want to, if you're a union person, mm-hmm. a lot of the financial planning is done for you by the union. Right. You know, you said it, yep. the benefits, I always say it at probably every one of these I'm at, yep. that the, the benefits are the union's best kept secret. Yep. You, you need to know about them. Mm-hmm. And you need to know about them early because stuff happens throughout your life. We were talking a bit about that. Sure. So you want to know the, the different decisions that you make throughout your whole life and how that's going to impact those different benefits that you have guaranteed to come with you. If you're not in a union, right. you need to have a plan. You need to create some sort of benefit yeah, for yourself. You have have as young garbage, as possible, right? as soon yeah, as you like can. A, like you said, Ed, when's the best time to start? Yesterday. Yeah. Right? Yeah, what's the second best time right now? Yeah, today. So it, it, tell us about the story. You, you told us a story off the air that I thought was interesting and, and telling, and probably, unfortunately, it probably affects half of our members. What? Tell us that. Yeah, so, um, you know, this this uh, is a 134 electrician was, was at our financial literacy seminar, and uh, last year, and he called me, he's 42 years old. He said, hey, Ron, just so you know, I'm getting divorced, uh, and I just want your advice. My wife wants, you know, 134 electricians, this A-card electrician has a defined benefit plan and like a 401k plan. They call it a defined contribution plan. Right. So he has, and he's like, my, my soon-to-be ex wants the 401k plan and not the defined benefit plan. He's like, what do you think? So hold on a second. If you're a soon-to-be ex-wife and listening to the show, earmuffs for a moment because we're talking to our members. <laughs> is that like, can I say that? Yeah, I don't see why not. Can right, I? Fair enough. All right. So what did you tell him? Yeah. So I and I said, hey, you know what? That's a good idea because we can create a plan where you can put outside money into some Roth IRA yeah. and mm-hmm. build that up again. Sure. You can't build that pension up again. That's right. Yeah. So and, and you know his wife wants she doesn't want a, a, a sum of money twenty years from now. Right. You know she's looking at this four hundred one k plan and saying, okay, I want I want that. Yeah. You can keep your pension plan. Right, and, I mean, and it's actually a good is, idea. And this is this is real life advice that is literally going to affect somebody's uh, pocketbook. And by the way, it's not a bad deal for the for the ex, right, or the she's getting the ex either, right? Getting, some of this yeah, disposable getting some cash available right money. Now, yeah. you know, who knows if she's going to live for the, until the time to collect uh, the pension or whatever. So, yeah, it's all, it's all fair. I mean, it's just he's right. asking to figure Strategy. out strategy. How do yeah. the numbers play out? Yeah, he's like, what do you think? And and when we give this advice, Ken, yeah. Ed, I mean, it's free, man. We don't, it's not like, okay, you owe me 50 bucks. Right. <laughs> right. You know, we, we sit and we talk with these people, create that plan. If they invest money with us, sure, we make money that way. Of course. Um, but again, for MCL unions, 10% discount. We yeah. act as a fiduciary. Yep. Yeah, that's which is a very big deal. Important. That's a very big deal. And and we have, you know, us here at Megan, we, ha- we provide so much more value. Because you know we don't have to make a phone call to figure out what your benefits are. That's right. right. And when you we say when you say uh, break this down in plain English, when you say you act as a fiduciary, what does that mean? Well, we just have to act in your best interest by law. Okay. Yeah, you can't well, just sell something like, oh, this is what's best for you, and sell the thing that's going to return the highest fees. You have to do what's in that, what's going to be the most beneficial for that person. Yep. No that's matter a huge no, deal. no matter what. Right. I yep. mean, so that's your your task with doing that. Just like a lawyer's task with zealously representing their client, your task with doing what's in the best interest uh, of your client. A union or a fund or a business agent or a president of a, a union technically can't give financial advice. Correct. No, they, I mean they can't, and that's why these these benefits are the best kept secret because right. they can't sit there and, and tell you about them. Right. You know, we're you know us here at Megan, we're the mechanism that gets the word out. Yeah. You know, we sit with the members' homes. And explain how those benefits will impact that family. Right. And if, and if you're a union, I hate to say it, but you know, it's it's quite frankly a really sort of simple, simplistic way to say, hey, number one, here's all the benefits that we have. But number two, I really can't give you financial advice. 
but that guy can, and he understands our fund, our pension, our health and welfare, all of our benefits, and he can actually tell you what to do. And by the way, he's been doing it for 25 or 30 mm-hmm. years and understands our world. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an enormous value add for any union. I, I don't care who you are, right? I, I agree, and, and Ken, our, our, the most important thing that we have is our reputation. There's right. no question about it. You know, I if we start giving bad advice or doing something crazy you out there, be, you wouldn't be in business. No. Yeah. And and we know that. Of and course. So we're not gonna we're not out there twisting arms. We're out there doing um, what's best for that person. If if some client who retires decides not to use us, maybe they have a family member. Sure. Maybe they've had a relationship with somebody. Right. It's fine. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You're not forcing. We're not forcing anybody. Not at all. But, but you're offering it. Well, what, what you do that I think is so important is when somebody comes into a union uh, as a young worker, it can be, welcome to your new career. Here's the training program. Here's where you're going to work on Monday. Also, you have a defined contribution plan, defined benefit plan, health care plan, health ser- healthcare savings plan, like all these things. And they're like, okay, where would you say to go to work on Monday? Like their first priority is the job. And so they can have all these things building up in the background and not really understand what it's all doing. So when you sit down with them and come up with a plan, um, a lot of times it sounds like they're they're learning a lot about benefits that they didn't know they had and I I know I know a lot of people who have worked with you and I've I've heard a lot of really great stories same, same. Um, yep. but I know one who was hoping to plan to retire in maybe five years and she found out that she could retire almost immediately um, <laughs> and it was because you know you you really explain these benefits that she already had so a lot of folks have these things. Thanks, and thanks they for just, helping us lose good people. <laughs> honestly, come on, Ron. But uh, the financial literacy and just the understanding of these benefits is so important. So uh, the unions, some unions do a tremendous job of this. It's important work. It's hard work. Some unions don't do as much work on it. But uh, the things that you do are extremely valuable to the members because a lot of these folks are in better positions than they thought they were. Well, and, and you know how it is if, if you know, uh, pensions – you know that type of stuff. It's it's confusing for mm-hmm. sure. And if if you don't understand something, yeah, you just really don't want to deal with it. At least right. I don't. It sits on a pile on my desk. Right. And <laughs> right. if it's a pension, I'm a young person, and you know this is something that that isn't going to affect me for 20 years. Yeah. I'll worry about it tomorrow. You know how life is. Of yeah. Course. You get, you get of life's course. busy. Yeah. You know. And if you get there early, you know, if you're listening and you're an apprentice or you're just coming into the trades or whatever, you know, meet with Megan Financial. Sit down. Get a game plan to going. And then set it and forget it. Exactly. Well, right. Yeah. And I mean, so the so the unions are creating these benefits. So yeah. you really don't really need to do anything. I think understanding them is very important. Absolutely. Because again, stuff happens throughout yeah. your life. But if you can do something outside of that, you know, maybe set up a Roth IRA so you have an, another bucket of money. Yeah. So you're not only reliant on what the union's doing for you. Yep. Gives you more options. And look. Yeah, plan. You're, making, you're you're making a good buck. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So could you take fifty cents an hour off your check and never notice it all day, every day? Contingency right? planning, because as they say, marriage is grand, but divorce is fifty grand. <laughs> good one. <laughs> nice one. Well listen, I uh as always uh, appreciate your coming down and, and talking to our listeners because I think what you do is really important, Ron. Um it's unique. You, like you said, like you have a niche in in this world. Um, so if you're listening, where can people reach you? Sure. Um, 708-444-1090 or on the web at megant.com, M-E-G-E-N-T.com. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming in, Ed. Anything else? No, that was great. It was always a pleasure to see you, Ron. Thanks, fellas. Hey, if you, uh, you have been listening, sorry, you've been listening to Ron Whittingham from Megant Financial right here on the Workers Mic 720 WGN. Welcome back, everybody, to the Workers' Mic here on 720 WGN. Uh, it was an interesting segment with Ron. We're always happy to have him in the studio. Yeah, he's a really smart guy, and it's nice the way he puts things in, into plain English, so you don't have to like struggle to you know, understand things that are, I think are, are relatively complex. Right. He really does make it easy. Yeah, um, very approachable. I think uh, every member that I know who's uh, who's seen him has has said good things. I mean, it makes yeah. it makes it simple. So um, before we get into our, our, our last story, which is a big one, I just want to mention uh, one thing, and that is if you are in the Midwest Coalition of Labor, uh, meaning that you're a member of a union that's part of the coalition, uh, right now it's open enrollment time for life insurance, uh, accidental death, dismemberment, uh, accident insurance, critical illness, et cetera, no medical questions, no exams, 
just check a box and it's yours. Um, the maximums have gone up this year again. We started at it was 150,000 max, and today it's 350,000 of life and 350,000 of accidental death and dismemberment that you can buy. Protect your families, guys, uh, ladies. You know, I know everybody thinks that they're invincible when they're young. Like, nothing's ever going to happen to me. Right. And, and then, you know, God forbid you get into a motorcycle accident or, you know, something does happen. You know, it, it's literally some, some of the cost if you're, if you're young or it's like Netflix, you know, or Hulu or something like that. For it's, sure. So um, if you want to, you can call 888-212-7822 um, and they'll help you enroll, answer any questions. You can also go to the Midwest Coalition of Labor's website at coalitionoflabor.org. Click on that link. You can enroll on the phone. You can enroll online. It takes five seconds. Um, you know, we've had just, unfortunately, we've had some some accidents lately. You sure. Know, people, that, you know, in the construction boxes. industry. Yeah, in construction, you know. And if you're a construction guy, you when you're not working at the job, generally, you know, you're working on your house. You're on a jet ski, a snowmobile. I mean, these are people that go, mm -hmm. you know. So so protect your families. Um, you know, we had one that unfortunately uh, passed away. Um, and he, you know, he was still uh, active and he had kidney cancer, I think, you know, a year plus ago. Uh, and then it came back, and he bought life insurance, and uh, his spouse got up at an IBW meeting and, and talked to you know a room full of uh, electricians, and you know not a dry in, in the house. I and mean, she said it was it saved saved her house, her kids. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's it's pretty positive. So anyway, that's that's my plug on that. And there's um, there's no medical exams, which nothing. I think is important because there are a lot of construction workers who are out there who've tried to get life insurance. Oh yeah. And it's like, what's your age? You know, what's your profession? I'm sorry. You know, the premiums are either going to be sky high uh, based on your health, based yeah. on your job, yeah. or we're not going to insure you. And this is no questions asked. It, it, find anywhere that will give you health, uh, life insurance, meaningful amounts of life insurance with no questions asked it does, at a it better does, price. It, it doesn't exist. Right. Um, and, and it's also tax-free. It's a, it's a way that people can transfer wealth. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, the rich have figured this out a long time ago and, and we're just starting to get it. So it, it is a very good way of transferring wealth to, to your children or, or spouse, et cetera. So you, you're right about that, Ed. Um, all right, let's, let's switch gears. Uh, there is a enormous strike um, that I think it was just a three-day strike. Mm -hmm. I think it ended yesterday, if I'm That's not mistaken. Right. Um, and, and it was uh, Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente. It's a healthcare company. Permanent Kaiser. I think in Spanish it means permanent Kaiser. <laughs> and who's Kaiser? Uh, now I don't, I'm not sure who Kaiser is. Either Kaiser Soze or the Kaiser. I mean, <laughs> Kaiser. you know, either way, a pretty ominous name. So 75,000 workers went right. on strike. I right. mean, I think that's the largest healthcare strike in history. It is. And what were what are they what were they striking over? Ed, you know. So there were um, there were a couple of things. I mean, wage increases were part of it. But also a huge part of it is the fact that a lot of these workers, these healthcare workers, are in labs where they used to be working with two other people. Now they're by themselves because there's a just a complete staffing shortage. Um, now, how do you solve a staffing shortage? Make the jobs more attractive to people that are looking. Pay more. Right. I mean, we saw that in Joliet a couple of uh, couple of weeks ago when they went on strike and they people were leaving and would get jobs, you know, ten miles down the road for a sixty percent pay increase. Right. Um, you know, if you want good people to work there. You have to pay them, so I think that all comes into play with uh, with these Kaiser folks. But yeah, seventy five thousand, and that's on top of one hundred and forty five thousand UAW workers. That's right. On top of all these Starbucks and these universities and these museums across the UPS, country, the numbers right? in the United States for strikes this year were already generationally high back in June, and these enormous strikes keep coming. And as we saw with the writers, the writers won. I mean, they hit a home run with their strike. Right. Um, and, and same with UPS. They hit an absolute grand slam. You've got $160,000 to, to be a UPS driver, right. and you're worth every penny of it. Right. right. And if companies are making money, workers should make money. And workers are finally starting to stand up and realize that. You know, in the healthcare industry, I think the strikes are a, a little, they're, they're a little more altruistic than yes. that. Like, just give me more money, right? Because they have patients to take care of. So you don't see a permanent strike even though it's permanente, um, you, you don't see a, a strike that goes on for weeks, months, forever in healthcare generally. Why? Because these people are, are nurses and doctors' assistants and you know medical professionals. They care about their patients, so right. they want to make sure that 
you know, they're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if you will, and that they're taking care of these folks. So they make them short, right. right, and get their point across. Well, you know, wages are an issue. Staffing is an issue. But there are still going to be people who are sick coming in the door who That's need right. care. So the, uh, as we saw in Joliet, again, it was just a couple of days long. Right. Um, you know, and they, they brought in uh, temporary workers in uh, Joliet. Once, for, a, with, once, once again, you want, a, you want a temp nurse? I don't. I don't either. I don't. But uh, no. Um, but yeah, so these people are standing up. They see the results of some of these other strikes, and success breeds success. Absolutely, so hats now, off. And now's the time. So uh, you know, we, we wish them well. We we certainly hope that they're successful in their strike. We think that they will be. Yeah, I think we got to wrap it up. Yeah, we do. That's it for this week, everybody. Well, listen. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Ron Whittingham, um, for coming in. Uh, good luck to the strikers out in uh, California. Um, shame on the signature room. And don't be a scab. And do not be a scab. You're listening to the Workers' Mic uh, right here on 720 WGN. We'll be back next week.